ocean liners, part two. For many a stormy wind shall blow where Jack comes home again. Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. For many a stormy wind shall blow where Jack comes home again. Many a, many a, many a, many a stormy wind shall blow. Table of contents, ocean liners, part two. Preface. All about ocean liners. Especially the great ships of the golden age of ocean liners traversing the Atlantic Ocean. Dr. Sidney Socloff. Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com. 2023. Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloff. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Coltov. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash yt navigator. Immigration. Immigration. This is an advertising poster for passage from Norway and Sweden to New York aboard ships of the Anchor Line. Emigration from England. This is an advertising poster for passage on the National Line from Liverpool and Queenstown to New York for $32 and back for $28. This picture shows the first-class passengers boarding the ship while the steerage passengers wait to board. This is an 1849 engraving of steerage and passengers preparing meals. The White Star Lines had sailings between Liverpool and New York. The fare is $20 from Liverpool to New York in steerage. These are East European immigrants getting their first look at America. The size and number of ocean liners increased from 1880 onward because of massive immigration to the United States. In the decade of 1900 to 1914, a total of 13 million people immigrated to the U.S. The peak immigration year was 1907 with 1,285,350 people. By 1914, one-third of the U.S. population was foreign-born. In recent years, immigration, both legal and illegal, has increased substantially, with most arriving now by plane or on foot. This shows the immigration to the U.S. from 1932 to 1998. Steerage passengers in the early days. All steerage passengers were taken to Ellis Island for examination and inspection. Over 98% of the immigrants were admitted to the U.S. These are steerage passengers eating dinner. The Irish potato famine of 1845 to 1849 resulted in a large flow of immigration across the Atlantic from Ireland to North America. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 considerably shortened the route from Britain to Asia. This was an excellent boost for steamships, since sailing vessels had difficulty navigating through the canal's restricted confines and wind conditions. Here is a P&O steamer in 1887 passing through the canal by Port Said. The period between the end of the 19th century and at World War II is considered the golden age of ocean liners. Driven by strong demand created by European emigration to the United States and Canada, international competition between passenger lines and a new emphasis on comfort, shipping companies built ever larger and faster ships. This is the elegant grand saloon of an Inman liner. 
such as the SS city of Paris or the SS city of New York in the late 1880s. The Canadian Pacific Railway became one of the largest transportation systems in the world. Combining with ships and railways operating from Canada in 1891, the shipping division began its first Pacific operation. Canadian Pacific's RMS Empress of Britain, commissioned in 1931, was the finest and fastest liner ever to serve on the St. Lawrence to the UK route. In 1903, the Canadian Pacific began its first Atlantic service because of the rising migration of Europeans to Western Canada due to the free land offered by the Canadian government. These are advertising posters of the Canadian Pacific Line. Since the 1830s ships had unofficially been competing for the honor of making the fastest Atlantic crossing known as the Blue Ray Band. In 1897, Germany took the award with a series of new ocean liners, starting with the SMS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse, named for the grandfather of the then reigning monarch, Kaiser Wilhelm II. In 1897, Germany took the award with a series of new ocean liners starting with the SMS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse, named for the grandfather of the then reigning monarch, Kaiser Wilhelm II. This was designed to be the largest, 14,349 GRT, and most powerful ship afloat. It was the first ocean liner with four funnels. It became the first German ship to win the Blue Ribbon by sailing across the Atlantic at 22.3 knots. The SMS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse is considered the first of the superliners, ships of over 1,000 feet in length and later on reaching 30 knots in speed, and considered the wonders of the modern world. Many of these ships became legendary, such as the Queen Mary. Mauritania, and Normandy, to name just a few. The giant quadruple expansion steam engines of the SMS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse stood 40 feet high. To keep these engines running required 80 men feeding 30 tons of coal an hour into 120 boilers. This is a diagram of a quadruple expansion steam engine. After the SMS Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse, North German Lloyd built three other large ships. These ships each had four funnels, and people equated the larger the number of funnels with size, speed and luxury. This is an advertising poster for ships of the North German Lloyd line. These ships traveled between Bremen and New York City, stopping at Southampton and Cherbourg. Further experimentation with steam engines led to the development of steam turbines, which use steam from the boilers to turn fan blades at high speed. This mechanical energy was harnessed to turn the propeller shaft. This is C. Charles Alger non Parsons. Developer of the steam turbine. The Turbinia, the first ship powered by a steam turbine, was built in 1894, just a few years after Parsons began manufacturing turbines. In 1897, the British engineer and visionary Charles Parsons captured the attention of the British Navy and royal family with his ship. Turbinia, the world's first steam turbine driven vessel. Parsons piloted the Turbinia through a parade of British naval ships during the celebration of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in June 1897, at an astounding 34.5 knots, 39 mph or 63 km per hour, shocking all in attendance. 
The Royal Navy's fastest ships gave chase but could not catch up to the speeding Turbinia. SSS 119A This is one of Turbinia's three turbines. Each one turns a propeller. Two years later Britain launched the first steam turbine-driven warship, the HMS Vipe, which made 36.5 knots. In 1905, Cunard was the first to fit an ocean liner with steam turbines when they fitted their liner, the SS Carmania, with steam turbines. It outperformed its nearly identical sister, the SS Coronia, which was powered by triple expansion steam engines. At the time, these were the largest ships in the Cunard fleet, and the use of the different propulsion methods in otherwise similar ships allowed the company to evaluate the merits of both. This is a large modern day steam turbine rotor. Despite its bulk, coal remained the fuel of choice until the beginning of the 20th century, in 1897. The same year that Parsons demonstrated the steam turbine before the British Navy and Royal Family, German engineer Rudolf Christian Karl Diesel built an engine that ran on petroleum-based liquid fuel. Although early diesel engines could not match the speed of coal-fired steam engines, they were lighter and did not wreck we boilers, water, and bulky coal to generate steam. Diesel engines could be operated by a few e-crew members and did not wreck we a team of firemen to shovel coal. By the early 1900s, Diesel engines began to replace coal-fired engines. Despite their advantages over steam engines and turbines, diesel engines were slow to replace steam power in passenger liners, which highly valued speed. Diesel engines powered barges hauling crude oil up rivers from the Caspian Sea to northern Europe. The first seagoing vessel fitted with a diesel engine was Vulcanus a small merchant vessel built for the Dutch East India Company in 1910. The RMS Lusitania The engines in the RMS Carmania proved to be a success. Consequently, in 1907, the Cunard Line introduced the much larger RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania two of the greatest liners ever built, both powered by steam turbines. Each ship was powered by Fu coal-fired steam turbines that drove Fu propellers, resulting in an impressive speed of 27 knots. The RMS Lusitania was built by John Brown and Company of Clyde Bank and was launched in 1906. Each ship was 240 meters, 790 feet long and weighed 28,000 tons. The RMS Lusitania was the world's first quadruple scrostoma and the first ship to exceed 30,000 tons. Has this the ship? The RMS Mauritania would go on to hold the Blue Riband foe an astonishing 20 years. These two ships became the first modern passenger liners with swift lines, steam turbines, steel hulls, and full propellers. This is the RMS Lusitania during Hesse Childs in May 1906. The large amount of smoke is due to the turbine engines not yet being adjusted properly. This is a postcard of the RMS Lusitania entering New York Harbor at the end of her maiden voyage on September 13, 1907.
The Castle Garden Immigration Center is in the left foreground. The RMS Lusitania was named for the ancient Roman province of Lusitania in present-day Portugal. The RMS Lusitania made her maiden voyage from Liverpool to New York on September 7, 1907. She was briefly the largest ship in the world until surpassed by her sister ship, RMS Mauritania, two months later. This is the RMS Lusitania at end of the first leg of her maiden voyage. New York City, September 1907. This is the first-class restaurant of the RMS Lusitania, done in a light and airy style by James Miller. The RMS Lusitania held the Blu-ray band for westbound and eastbound Atlantic crossings. The RMS Lusitania was not requisitioned in World War I like her sister and maintained monthly sailings between Liverpool and New York. On May 7, 1915, the RMS Lusitania was torpedoed without warning by the German submarine U-20 off the old head of Kinsale, Ireland, and sank within 18 minutes. A total of 761 people were rescued, while casualties were 1,198. The RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania are sister ships. Both built in 1907. The RMS Lusitania was 31,550 GRT and had a speed of 25 knots. On May 1, 1915, the German Embassy in Washington, D.C., ran ads in the New York papers in addition to verbal announcements warning Americans that the ship would be attacked. Three months earlier, Germany had issued a proclamation that the waters around the British Isles were part of the war zone. The RMS Lusitania service ended when the ship was struck by a torpedo from a German U-boat on May 7, 1915. Only 764 people survived the sinking, 1201 passengers and crew died including 128 Americans. This was despite its speed and supposedly non-military role. Germany justified the attack by claiming the RMS Lusitania was carrying military cargo. Contrary to widespread belief, there has never been any proof to support these allegations. The work of respected marine archaeologists like Dr. Robert Ballard has failed to find evidence of military items on board. This lack of evidence supports the RMS Lusitania's original manifest, which did not declare any cargo of military origin. The sinking of the RMS Lusitania on May 7, 1915, triggered a bitter propaganda campaign by the British against Germany. This poster is related to a propaganda campaign by the British against Germany after the sinking of the RMS Lusitania. This is the RMS Lusitania Memorial in Cove, formerly Queenstown, the port in Southern Ireland where many of those who died in the sinking of the RMS Lusitania are buried. This is the Lusitania medal, struck in Germany, to celebrate the sinking of the RMS Lusitania. The RMS Mauritania 1906 The Cunard Line's RMS Mauritania and RMS Aquitania were widely considered the finest of all the liners of their generation, and in the decades following, Many had a similar devotion to the SS Normandy. The RMS Mauritania, also known as Mori, sister ship of the RMS Lusitania, was an ocean liner built by Swan Hunter and Wiggum Richardson at Walsheim Tyne and Ware, 
and was launched in September 1906. The RMS Mauritania was the first large liner to be equipped with turbines. At the time, she was the largest and fastest ship in the world. Particularly notable was her steam turbine propulsion, which was a revolutionary development in ocean liner design. The RMS Mauritania held the Blue Riband for the fastest Atlantic crossing for 22 years from 1907 to 1929. This is the RMS Equitania leaving the Clydebank shipyard in April 1913. The RMS Mauritania was 790 feet long, 241 meters, 31,938 GRT, and carried 2,335 passengers and a crew of 800. It could cruise from Liverpool to New York in slightly under five days with great reliability at 25 knots. The RMS Mauritania became a favorite among the passengers because of her luxury, speed, and safety. The ship's name was taken from Mauritania, a Roman province on the northwest African coast not related to the modern Mauritania. Similar nomenclature was also employed by RMS Mauritania's sister ship, the RMS Lusitania, which was named after the Roman province directly north of Mauritania, across the Strait of Gibraltar. The RMS Mauritania served as a tow-up ship during World War I. After the United States declared war on Germany in 1917, she carried thousands of American troops to Europe until the end of the war. The RMS Mauritania also served as a hospital ship named His Majesty's Hospital Ship Mauritania. The RMS Mauritania returned to civilian service after the end of the war in September 1919. Cunard withdrew the RMS Mauritania from service following a final eastward crossing from New York to Southampton in September 1934 after 28 years of service. The RMS Aquitania The Cunard liner RMS Aquitania was built by the John Brown and Company shipyard, near Clydebank, Scotland. She was launched in April 1913 and sailed on her maiden voyage to New York in May 1914. This event was, however, overshadowed by the sinking of the RMS Titanic just two weeks before. As the third in Cunard Line's grand trio of express liners, preceded by the RMS Mauritania and RMS Lusitania, the RMS Aquitania was considered one of the most attractive ships of her time. The RMS Aquitania earned the nickname Ship Beautiful. In 36 years of service, the RMS Aquitania survived military duty in both world wars and was returned to passenger service after each war. Aquitania's record for the longest service career of any 20th century express liner stood until 2004 when RMS Queen Elizabeth II, with an ultimate career service of 40 years, became the longest serving liner. This famous pasta of the RMS Aquitania shows a cutaway of the ship, revealing its luxurious interior. This is the first glass lounge of the RMS Aquitania. The RMS Aquitania served as a tow-up ship during World War I and was a hospital ship during the Dardanelles campaign in 1915. In her years of service during the Second World War, 
The RMS Equitania sailed more than 500,000 miles and carried nearly 400,000 soldiers. The vessel was retired and scrapped in 1950 in Scotland, thus ending an illustrious career that included steaming 3 million miles in 450 voyages. Aquitania carried 1.2 million passengers over a career that spanned nearly 36 years, making her the longest-serving express liner of the 20th century. She was the only major liner to serve in both world wars and was scrapped as the last full funneled passenger ship. The RMS Aquitania's wheel and a fine half model may be seen in the Cunard exhibit at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic in Halifax. The Hamburg America Line The Hamburg America Line also ordered three giant ships. SS Imperator, Fetterland and Bismarck. All over 51,500 gross tons. The first of these ships, SS Imperator, was launched in 1912. The largest, the SS Bismarck, would be the largest ship in the world until 1935. Before World War I, these ships would see little or no service with the Hamburg America Line. After the war, they were seized as war reparations and given to British and American lines. The Hamburg America Line, also known as the Hamburg America Line and the Hamburg Line, was established in Hamburg, Germany. In 1847 under the name Hamburg American Eich Packet für Action Gesellschaft, HAPAG, for shipping across the Atlantic Ocean. In 1970, HAPAG merged with the Norddeutscher Lloyd, North German Lloyd, of Bremen to establish HAPAG Lloyd as it is known today. This is Hamburg America's first ship, the SS Deutschland. Before World War I, the Hamburg America Line had the largest merchant fleet in the world. 175 ships, to be exact. This fleet was topped off by the giant 52,000-ton SS Imperator and the even larger SS Vaterland. Behind the Hamburg America Line was Albert Ballin, managing director of the line. Albert Ballin was highly nationalistic and felt that size and luxury, not speed, were the bywords of the transatlantic run. After World War I, Germany was defeated, and Albert Ballin committed suicide. In honor of Albert Ballin, the Hamburg America Line named the ship after him. The SS Albert Bellin. Launched in 1923. In the fall of 1935, the SS Albert Bellin was the subject of an unpleasant dispute. The Nazis noted that this ship was named for a person who, though honorable and patriotic, was nonetheless Jewish, and they pressed for a name change. The Hamburg America line initially resisted, but then finally gave in and renamed the ship, the SS Hansa. This is the bow of the immense SS Imperator before her launch in 1913. This is the stern of the SS Imperator before her launch in 1913. This is the SS Imperator with a large figurehead added to the bow to increase her length by 10 feet, 3 meters, making her longer than any Cunard ship. The SS Imperator was top-heavy and unstable and had a pronounced list, as evident in this picture. This is a German art postcard of the SS Imperator in Hamburg. With her distinguished figurehead, the SS Imperator towers beside a tugboat. 
This is a German art postcard of the SS Imperator after the bow eagle was removed. Note that the postcard says, The greatest in the world. This is the steerage dining area in the SS Imperator, 1913. This is the Grand Social Hall on board the SS Imperato. As part of the Versailles Treaty, at the end of World War I, the three German ocean liners were given to the Allies. The SS Imperator was handed over to the British as compensation for the RMS Lusitania and renamed SS Berengaria. These are the specifications of the SS Imperator. SS Berengaria. In 1914, the second of Balin's trio entered service. She was the SS Fatir Land, and she had a gross tonnage some 2,000 tons higher than the SS Imperator. Added to this, she was 31 feet longer than the SS Imperator, which now was replaced as the largest ship in the world. Painted in familiar Haypag colors, the SS Fatirlan entered service as the largest ship in the world in 1914. This is the SS Fatirlan. This is a poster for the SS Fatirlan. This is SS Fatirlan's impressive first class dining salon. After making only seven crossings, the SS Fatia land was in Hoboken, New Jersey. When the war broke out, she was ordered to stay at Hoboken Pie. After three years in uncertain limbo, the U.S. entered World War I. American authorities seized the Fatia land, and three months later, she had been transformed into the U.S. Navy Transport SS Leviathan. Through a quirk of fate, her new task was now to help defeat her one-time creators. The SS Leviathan entered wartime service on the North Atlantic, ferrying troops to the European battlefields. Her contribution was of great importance carrying more than 100,000 soldiers on 19 voyages. At one point, she carried 14,416 souls, at the time, the largest number ever to be transported by a single ship. After the war, the SS Leviathan was handed over to the United States lines and became the flagship of the American merchant fleet. This is the SS Leviathan's nightclub, done in a 1920s modern style. With nearly all Hester and dismantled, the SS Leviathan is seen headering Hess scrapping at Rosyth. Shortly afterward, also in 1914, just before the outbreak of World War I, the third of the class was launched. She was the SS Bismarck, and with a proposed 56,000 tons, she would not be exceeded in size until the mid-1930s. The SS Fatir Land went into American hands and became their SS Leviathan. The Bismarck was given to the British and renamed Majestic, replacing White Star's lost 48,000 ton or Britannic, when the Bismarck Majestic had been handed over to White Star, she immediately became the new company's flagship. This is the mine lounge of the Bremen in the 1920s. The firm Albert Allen had led slowly began to rebuild after most of its vessels had been sunk or seized during and after World War I. However, the idea was a different one than during Balin's time. This was partly because of new immigration quotas in the United States which greatly cut the number of steerage passengers. 
the ocean liner's supremacy was put aside. And the focus was now on medium size and economical operations. These are newspaper cartoons from 1907 of the air and sea rivalry in the North Atlantic Ocean for the biggest and fastest between Germany and Britain in the years before World War I. The Holland America Line, HAL. The Holland America Line. The Holland America Line. This is the Norwegian America Line's SS Devanger Fjord. Launched in 1918. This is the Swedish American Line's SS Dronning Halm of 1905. Hapag Lloyd offered transatlantic travel via airship in 2.5 days from Germany to the US. This shows a zeppelin over Lake Constance or the Bowdoin Sea. This is the Hindenburg passing over New York City. The SS Isle Day, France carried a seaplane carrying the mail for launching 72 hours ahead of the ship's arrival in port. Here, the plane is on its launching catapult on the ship's stern. In 1907, when Bruce's May, director of the White Star Line, decided to outmatch Cunard's RMS Lusitania and Mauritania, he did not intend to build only one or two vessels. The decision was that three vessels should be constructed. The first two, built almost simultaneously, should be followed by a third. The three ships would be called the Olympic, Titanic and Gigantic. After the sinking of the RMS Titanic, the RMS Gigantic was renamed the RMS Britannic. White Star wanted its new ships to be the largest and finest of the Atlantic Ocean liners of the day, although not necessarily the fastest. These are White Star posters. These are White Star posters. This is an early White Star poster. This is an early White Star poster. In 1910, the White Star launched the RMS Olympic. The first of a trio of 45,000 plus gross ton liners that was also to include the Titanic and Britannic. These three ships were almost 15,000 tons larger and 100 feet longer than the RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania. Here is the Titanic and Olympic under construction at the Harland and Wald shipyard in 1910. This is a bow view of the RMS Olympic before her launch in October of 1910. Her sister ship, the Titanic, is to the left. These are workers leaving the Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast in May of 1911. In the distance is the Titanic. When she entered the Atlantic trade route, the RMS Olympic was the largest moving object ever created. She quickly became a very popular ship among passengers and crew. This is the RMS Olympic, sister ship to the Titanic. This is the RMS Titanic. The Titanic was greatly lacking in the number of lifeboats. This was common on the seas. However, there had not been a change in the Board of Trade's restrictions since the previous century. And because there were not any ships exceeding 10,000 gross tons in those times, there were no restrictions concerning larger ships. 
as the Titanic was 46,328 gross tons large. She needed many more lifeboats than she carried. She was allowed to carry nearly 3,500 passengers. But there was only room in the lifeboat for about 1,200. But nobody worried about this. For the ship was the latest in safety and had 16 strong bulkheads inside her hull and a double bottom large enough for a man to stand. Any two of the Titanic's largest compartments could be flooded at any time. And still, the ship would remain afloat. All of the first four compartments could be filled without endangering the ship's floatability. Damage larger than that was not ever imagined. The number of lifeboats for the Titanic was given initially as follows. Boats will accommodate 3,538 passengers and crew, 3,473. Spare, 65. The number of lifeboats for the Titanic were originally given as Boats will accommodate 3,538 passengers and crew on board. 3,473 spare 65. These we crossed out with a heavy red line. And a much smaller number of lifeboats we used because the owners felt that too many would spoil the ship's looks. This is Captain John Smith of the RMS Titanic. Like so many other ships, the Olympic and Titanic were rumored to be unsinkable. The White Star Line itself never made this claim. It was Stone and Lloyd, the company that made the watertight doors in ships' bulkheads, that said that thanks to their material, the new vessels were practically unsinkable. The public removed practically. And the vessels came to be called unsinkable. This is the first Class A Grave Lockhart restaurant on board the Titanic. Titanic features not available on the Olympic are the two private promenade areas on B deck. The Titanic sank on its maiden voyage when it struck an iceberg on April 14, 1912, off Newfoundland. A severe shortage of lifeboats contributed to the deaths of more than 1,500 people. In 1912, the Titanic sank after hitting an iceberg, claiming more than 1,500 lives. Not enough lifeboats for everyone contributed to the high loss of life. After the Titanic disaster, the regulation was revised to require all ocean liners to carry enough lifeboats for all passengers and crew. These are photographs of Titanic survivors in lifeboats found in a case file of a limitation of liability suit brought after the liner sinking in 1912. Just before the Titanic broke in half, her stern rose high in the air, the light still gleaming in the night. Lifeboats approach the Cunarder Carpathia as day breaks. Titanic Newspaper Stories Many stories were wild exaggerations or were completely untrue. These are some of the newspaper stories about the sinking of the Titanic. This is a newspaper story about the sinking of the Titanic. This is another newspaper story about the sinking of the Titanic. After the Titanic disaster, the International Ice Patrol was established to monitor the busy North Atlantic shipping lanes for icebergs. Still recognizable. The wreck of the Titanic stands as a monument of a lost era. These are the specifications of the RMS Titanic. 
This is the White Star Line announcement of the new gigantic, later renamed RMS Britannic. After the sinking of the RMS Titanic, the RMS Olympic went on sailing without her sister ship for a couple of years. But eventually, the RMS Britannic was launched. This is the HMHS Britannic. Being built at Harland and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast. The RMS Britannic was renamed for wartime service as His Majesty's Hospital Ship Britannic. At the time the Britannic was launched in 1914, World War I broke out, and she was turned into a hospital ship and later sunk by a mine in the Mediterranean in 1916. This is the first class dining room aboard the SS France in 1912. Ocean liners played a significant role in World War I. Large ocean liners, such as RMS Mauritania and RMS Olympic, were used as troop ships and hospital ships, while smaller ocean liners were converted to armed merchant cruisers. The Britannic, sister to the Titanic and Olympic, never served on the liner trade for which she was built. Instead entering war service as a hospital ship as soon as she was completed. She lasted a year before being sunk by a mine. Some other liners were fitted with hidden guns, codenamed Q-ships. They were purposely designed to hunt down submarines. The RMS Lusitania and RMS Mauritania are sister ships. Both built in 1907. The RMS Lusitania was 31,550 GRT and had a speed of 25 knots. On May 1, 1915, the German Embassy in Washington, D.C., ran ads in the New York papers. In addition to verbal announcements, warning Americans that the ship would be attacked. Three months earlier, Germany had issued a proclamation that the waters around the British Isles were part of the war zone. The RMS Lusitania's service ended when the ship was struck by a torpedo from a German U-boat on May 7, 1915. Only 764 people survived the sinking. A total of 1,201 passengers and crew died, including 128 Americans. This was despite its speed and supposed non-military role. Germany justified the attack by claiming the RMS Lusitania was carrying military cargo. However, contrary to popular belief, there has never been any proof to support these allegations. The work of respected marine archaeologists like Dr. Robert Ballard has failed to find evidence of military items on board. This lack of evidence supports the RMS Lusitania's original manifest, which did not declare any cargo of military origin. The sinking of the RMS Lusitania on May 7, 1915, triggered a bitter propaganda campaign by the British against Germany. This is the RMS Lusitania Memorial in Cove, formerly Queenstown, the port in Southern Ireland, where many of those who died in the sinking of the RMS Lusitania are buried. This is the Lusitania Medal, struck in Germany, to celebrate the sinking of the RMS Lusitania. This is the RMS Mauritania. The RMS Lusitania's sister ship, in dazzle paint camouflage in World War I. These are Australians going to war on a P&O steamer in 1916. Until the 1920s, 
most shipping lines relied heavily on immigration for sales. And they were hard hit when the U.S. Congress introduced a bill to limit immigration into the United States. As a result, many ships took on cruising, and the least expensive cabins were reconfigured from third class to tourist class. To make matters worse, the Great Depression put many shipping lines into bankruptcy. Despite the harsh economic conditions, a number of companies continued to build larger and faster ships in 1929. The German ships SS Bremen and Europa beat the crossing record set by the RMS Mauritania 20 years earlier with an average speed of almost 28 knots. These ships used bulbous bows and oil-fired boilers to reach these high speeds, while maintaining economical operating costs. In ships that have had bulbous bows fitted, gains in fuel efficiency of between 12 to 15 percent, a standard. As these factors are particularly important for almost all applications of maritime vessels, bulbous bows have seen widespread adoption since their development. Union Castle Line boasted of a mere 17 days between London and Cape Town in these pre-airline days. Despite the worldwide depression, the 1930s were a golden age for ocean liners. Three of the most luxurious ships ever built were launched then, the SS Normandy, France, the RMS Queen Mary, England, and the RMS Queen Elizabeth, England. Each ship was more than 1,000 foot long, about 305 meters, and could cross the Atlantic in four days. The RMS Queen Elizabeth, at 84,000 tons, was the largest in size. The RMS Queen Elizabeth, RMS Queen Mary and SS Normandy, at that time, the three largest ships afloat, are shown here held for safekeeping by the U.S. authorities in New York Harbor in 1940. The RMS Queen Elizabeth, RMS Queen Mary and SS Normandy, at that time, the three largest ships afloat, are shown here held for safekeeping by the U.S. authorities in New York Harbor in 1940. Five great liners are side by side in New York Harbor in early 1940. From the top, Italy's Rex, the Aquitania, the RMS Queen Mary, the Normandy, and the Isle de France. Five great liners are side by side in New York Harbor in early 1940. From the top, Italy's Rex, the Aquitania, the RMS Queen Mary, the Normandy, and the Isle de France. The Compagnie Générale Transatlantique is also known as the French Line. The French Line's SS Paris was launched in 1916, but did not enter service until 1921. French Line's SS Ile de France entered service in 1927. The SS Isle de France launched in 1927, began the Art Deco ocean liner style that was now copied on shore, whereas previously, it had been the reverse. This ship started a new phase of the golden age of ocean liners. The SS Isle de France caused a sensation among the style conscious and wealthy. To be genuinely chic, one must have made a transatlantic passage on the SS Isle de France. Both Cunard and White Star we planning new ships of both great speed and size. 
The Compagnie Générale Transatlantique did not want to be left behind. They wanted a super ship of their own. Other ships of the late 1920s and 30s follow this trend, most especially the ships of the French line, such as the SS Normandy, launched in 1935. In addition to the Art Deco design, the ships of the French line were also style settings in the culinary arts. Indeed, it is said that more birds followed the ships of the French line than any other. The cuisine on the ships of the French line was the equal of the finest restaurants in Paris. So, the Compagnie Générale Transatlantique approached the reliable Penhart shipyards at Saint-Nazaire. To compete with the British giants being built across the channel, three figures had already been set for the new vessel, she would have to be some 80,000 tons, over 1,000 feet in length, and she had to average a speed of 30 knots. To meet the speed requirement, the ship needed very powerful and fuel-efficient engines. Ever since the RMS Mauritania and RMS Lusitania, all ocean liners have relied on the steam turbine engine. But although powerful and economical, the turbine has a major flaw, it can only turn in one direction. To be able to go astern, a vessel fitted with turbines has to have auxiliary turbines installed to turn the propellers in the opposite direction. The French designers came up with a solution. The new ship would be fitted with steam turbines, but these would not power the propellers. But a set of electrical generators, which would power electric motors and these, in turn, would power the propellers. This solution produced a set of engines that would prove very successful. The problem of going astern was thus erased, as the electric motors could turn in both ways. The Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, the French line. Full of confidence in his potential, Former Russian citizen Vladimir Yurkovich approached the French line with a suggestion to use a revolutionary hull design. The design was developed entirely by himself, and if it had not been for the fact that he once had designed four battle cruisers for the Russian Navy, likely, the CGT had politely but firmly asked him to go away. But with the aid of some friends in high places, Yorkovich soon managed to make the French engineers listen to his ideas and suggestions. He had first turned to the Cunard line with his offer, but the ever-conservative British had turned him down. They figured the old, tested hull type was the best for their new flagship. Against all odds, the French engineers were actually impressed by what they heard and saw. From Yorkovich's specifications, they constructed a model that was tested against their own hull design. The result was astonishing. Yorkovich's design proved to be far more efficient than any hull design constructed before. The result was the bulbous bar. This is the SS Normandy being fitted out at Saint Nazaire. The dummy funnel has not yet been installed. With the slanting clipper-like bow and the bulbous forefoot beneath the waterline in combination with the slim hull, this revolutionary design would create a hull with unprecedented hydrodynamic qualities, making almost no bow wave and leaving only a thin, calm wake in its trail. Here, at full speed, the Normandy produces very little wake at the bow and minimal wake astern due to the innovation of the bulbous bow. 
SSS 213. In 1935, the French liner SS Normandy used its revolutionary new hull design and powerful turbo-electric propulsion to take the blue ribbon from the Italian wrecks. This is the SS Normandy arriving in Lower Manhattan on her first transatlantic voyage. The liners by Rob McCauley 090. This is the SS Normandy, showing very little wake at the bow and astern due to its bulbous bow. The great masterpiece of the ship was the first class dining room. This room was by far the largest one ever afloat. It was 305 feet, 93 meters, long, 46 feet, 14 meters, white and 26 feet, 8 meters, high. With its 150 tables, it could seat 700 guests and a fathom some of the finest meals on board a ship. Twelve tall pillars of lilac glass illuminated the room. And along the walls stood 38 columns equally bright. This room would earn the SS Normandy her nickname the Ship of Light. The SS Normandy was indeed a first-class ship. Although the largest ship in the world at 79,280 tons, she carried only 848 first-class passengers. 670 in tourist class and 454 in third. A total of 1,972 people. These passengers were looked after by a crew of 1,339. This is Marlene Dietrich with her large collection of luggage aboard the SS Normandy in 1938. On May 29, 1935, the SS Normandy set sail for New York on her maiden voyage. On May 31st, it was announced that the SS Normandy had made a first day run of 744 nautical miles, a world record, by averaging 29.76 knots during the first 24 hours. The SS Normandy arrived in New York after four days, three hours and 14 minutes. She had crossed the North Atlantic with an average speed of 29.98 knots, faster than any liner before her. A marvelous success. She took the blue ribbon away from the Italian line's wrecks. In July of 1937, the SS Normandy pushed her engines further and averaged 30.58 knots westbound and 31.20 knots eastbound. The grand and luxurious interiors of the SS Normandy were indeed beautiful, but seemed almost to frighten the regular traveler. She was a ship for the famous, film stars and royalties, and as a result, she seldom sailed more than 60% full. Perhaps no Atlantic liner was more admired for beauty than the SS Normandy. Pictorial History of Steam Pui the RMS Queen Mary had been decorated in a more modest style. She was luxurious but in a more comfortable way. The traveling public favored the Queen. And she was booked nearly solid on almost all of her sailings. On August 31, 1939, the SS Normandy was laid up in New York after completing her 139th crossing due to the impending threat of war in Europe. These fears were justified the following day when Germany invaded Poland and the Second World War began. Her rival, the RMS Queen Mary, was beside her on the south side of Cunard's Pier 90. In March of 1940, the brand new 83,673-ton RMS Queen Elizabeth arrived. She had just made her secret maiden voyage across the North Atlantic in a daring escape from the threat of German bombers. For a brief period, 
The only three liners to exceed 80,000 gross tons were moored beside each other. The RMS Queen Elizabeth on the north side of Pier 90. The RMS Queen Mary would soon sail to Sydney to convert into a troop transport. In June of 1940, France surrendered to Nazi Germany. The Normandy was immediately taken into protective custody by the U.S. Coast Guard, who introduced armed security patrols against sabotage. It was essential to protect such a great ship should she ever be needed for war duties. On December 7, 1941, Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor, and the United States entered the war on the side of Great Britain and its allies. Five days later, on December 12, the SS Normandy was taken over, with compensation promised, by the U.S. Maritime Commission. The French flag was lowered, and the SS Normandy was handed over to the U.S. Navy and renamed SS Lafayette. It had been decided that the SS Normandy was to be converted into a trooper, just like the two queens. But there was no dry dock in New York large enough to accommodate her. Therefore, the conversion work was carried out frantically, where she lay at Pier 88. On February 9, 1941, disaster struck. A spark from one of the acetylene torches landed on a pile of highly flammable Kapok life jackets. No fire watch was on duty and no one could find the fire alarm, that at the time was disconnected anyway. Someone managed to produce a fire hose, but it was completely dry after emptying a bucket full of water. It took about 12 minutes before the New York Fire Department was alerted, and when they finally arrived at the scene, they could not get on board the ship because of the great number of workmen fleeing the blazing inferno. After an hour of chaos and turmoil, the firefighters could finally board the burning SS Normandy and start their difficult task of controlling the fire. Water was desperately pumped over the burning liner to fight the raging blaze. Unfortunately, water was being poured onto the French liner, and she began to take on a dangerous list to port. The ship's compartmentation kept the water from entering the lower decks, making her top heavy. Vladimir Yorkovich, who had designed her, arrived at the scene and offered to go on board the ship and open the seacocks. By doing so, the SS Normandy would have settled on an even keel in the mud, rescuing her from heeling over. But the Navy commander at the scene did not want Yorkovich's help. This is a Navy job, he said. And so, as night fell on the SS Normandy, she was leaning farther and farther away from the pier. The fire had been brought under control but at a terrible cost. The following day, the SS Normandy slid almost gently onto her port side at an angle of 79 degrees. Her stern slid under the pier, and her bow slid across the berth towards Pier 90. The Liners by Rob McCauley 106 She seemed at total loss, but there was hope of salvaging her and turning her into a troop ship. Twelve days after the disastrous fire, the difficult salvage work began, but it was not until October 1943 that the SS Normandy was back on an even keel and was handed over to the U.S. Navy. By then, the ship was no longer needed for the war effort. She was in worse condition than expected, and no one knew what to do with her. The SS Normandy was towed down the Hudson to the Brooklyn Navy Yard Zuri Basin to await her ultimate fate. Several suggestions were made, but ultimately, it was decided to sell the SS Normandy for scrap. 
she had seen only four years of commercial service throughout her short life. Some say that the SS Normandy was the grandest ocean liner of all. These are the specifications of the SS Normandy. Recommended videos, Ocean Liners, Part 2 Recommended video, The Rise of the Ocean Liner, Evolution of Ocean Liners Documentary Part 1 Recommended video, The Rise of the Ocean Liner, Evolution of Ocean Liners Documentary Part 2 Recommended video, Floating Palaces Volume 1, Ocean Liner Documentary. Recommended video, Floating Palaces Volume 1, Ocean Liner Documentary. Recommended video, Floating Palaces Volume 1, Ocean Liner Documentary. Recommended video. Floating Palaces Volume 1, Ocean Liner Documentary Recommended Video, Floating Palaces Volume 1, Ocean Liner Documentary Recommended Video, Floating Palaces The Great Atlantic Ocean Liners Recommended Video, 15 Largest Ocean Liners in the World Recommended Video, The Liners Ships of Destiny, Episode 1, Maiden Voyage Recommended Video, The Liners, Ships of Destiny, Episode 2, Ships of War Recommended Video, The Liners, Ships of Destiny, Episode 3, The Great Duel Recommended Video, The Liners, Ships of Destiny, Episode 4, Endless Voyage Recommended video, YouTube navigation. Table of contents, Ocean Liners, Part 2. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.